west to Worcester, the final furlong in the 2015 Local Government Challenge. A challenge where lives are on the line. It's supposed to be convincing me that I can do this, right? And it's decision day as nine candidates become just four finalists. So who will go out and who will go through? It is very close, so close, that I think we are probably going to end up in a tie-break situation. I'll worry about that later. Sarah Porter, Angela Glitherow, Kelsey Hill, Matt Riggs, Jude Taylor, Philippa Mellish, Ben Smith, Joe Iverson, Stuart Lester. The bar's even higher in number five than it, than it has been. Survived it. <laughs> Is everybody happy? <laughs>
For others, it's clear this sort of experience is well outside their comfort zone. Absolutely terrible. I hate talking to people that I don't know, so this is my worst nightmare. <laughs> I'm not selling anything. Not I really, I haven't known. OK, Sorry. all right then, thanks anyway. The day's been non-stop, so it's been easy for the candidates to forget the other reason they're here. Before they leave Worcester tomorrow, they'll find out whether their performances over the past five challenges since January have given them a ticket to the top, one of the final four going through to the Local Government Association's annual conference in Harrogate. I think they're quite excited by this because it's something different, but I'm also thinking at the back of their minds we'll be playing who's going to get through to the final, is it going to be me, what, what is that process going to be? Because we haven't really let them on yet because we're not sure. It is very close, it's not, we're not sure at the moment where there's going to be a tiebreaker and who's going to be involved in that process because it is all still to play for. Uh, I'm thinking about this challenge really a lot, just being here, being in Worcester, meeting lots of great people and just getting on with the job. Back to base now, past the city's most famous landmark, and the rest of the day is devoted to team time to start planning their campaigns. It's perhaps becoming clear that this task isn't as simple as it first seemed. So you've got to find somebody that is physically and mentally capable of being a firefighter, but also when you talk about the retained element, their circumstances need to be suitable as well. They need to live within five minutes of a fire station, they need to make themselves available for a minimum of 40 hours a week. The question says that we need a campaign that will uh, apply to a wide range of people, so we need to make sure that we're considering views of, of the whole spectrum of people. All right then, so we'll um, see you back here. As the day draws to a close, Team Catalyst have one more idea to do their own fact-finding. They're off to talk to people in a gym. We're going out to see if they would be encouraged and actually to say, would they be interested in signing up? And we'll take their details. It's their last chance today to make their mark. Day two, and the deadline approaches. But for a female volunteer from each team, there's a diversion. Philippa Mellish and Sarah Porter are about to get some hands-on experience. What we thought would be a good idea is that because you're looking at what the retained duty system firefighters would be expected to do, is actually get some hands-on the equipment. Can we go put it on like a backpack? This is supposed to be convincing me that I can do this, right? Yeah, I don't know what, it's not actually as, as bad. I think I, I, well, I could walk around like a tortoise, but I'm not sure I could pick people up or move people in it. I think I'd need some training to kind of get used to wearing it, but it um, seems surprisingly, I mean, apart from the fact I haven't got a full kit on, it feels surprisingly OK, actually. And the experience has given Sarah an idea. Just talking about me putting one of the BAs on during the presentation just to kind of show that women can do stuff with breathing apparatus on. And those presentations are drawing near. At the moment, I'm doing some pretty pictures. <laughs> so I'm, I'm the face of it all. Beautiful. Just a start. The heat is on because the presentations are earlier in the day than usual. The selection process for the final is looming in the background. Yeah, I think it's there in my mind. But at the moment, I've got a website to build and some posters to make. All that's in my mind is finishing the, this project at the moment. I'll worry about that later. Meanwhile, there's something going on outside with Jude and a fire engine. All is about to be revealed in the presentations. We won't start timing you until you tell us you're ready to start. Aspire go first. In front of a panel chaired as usual by Claire Holloway, head of corporate governance at the local government association. Alongside her from the fire service are Mark Yates, chief fire officer, director of services John Price and director of finance Martin Rehon. And from the main challenge sponsors, Rupert Harris, senior manager at Lloyds Bank in Worcester.
hashtag ready. And that's what we're going for. It's able to marry that physical world with the online world. It's very flexible because we can do all the extra little bits after it so we can tailor to specific markets, that kind of thing, and look at three particular areas. The uh, hashtag ready to train, the ready to share, and the ready to change. The barrier is that people don't think that they're not ready. Um, we're thinking that we would introduce a boot camp in fire stations so you can introduce it across any of your fire stations. You've got personal training instructors already as part of your fire service. So this can be run at an extremely low cost. It will uh, engage people in the local community to come into the fire station and see how the fire station works. Are you ready to change and are you ready to embrace some new ways of working? Could you consider having a, a fire technician role that's still very highly trained and, and still has the same safety standards that, that, that you hold very dear, but actually perhaps have a slightly lower requirement in terms of what their, their role is expected to do and therefore what the training requirements are for that role? Maybe an unfair question because I'm already impressed by the grasp you've got the Fire and Rescue Service in a 24-hour period. But have you any idea of the, what are the activities or technical competencies that this person perhaps wouldn't do to lessen the training requirement? Maybe a driver. So what, someone who could get the appliance to an emergency situation quickly and safely and would be able to provide some support from the appliance, but not actually, in the instance of a fire, go into the building itself. You've come up with four or five different strands of things. They all make absolute sense to me. Mm -hmm. I'm just keen to know which one you think is the strand that should be pushed first. I think the ready to train one, personally, not just because it was mine, but because <laughs> <laughs> nice but because because you can very easily set up a boot camp and do that kind of really immediate kind of local engagement and just getting people into fire stations. And he just said to me, "Why don't you just go and have a go?" So again, not thinking I could do it, visited the local fire station. Uh, then it's Catalyst's board, turn, and they and too go, start with video. And, um, yeah, it's been fantastic. So. Um, I'd recommend that anybody has a, has a go at it and just tries it. So we want to use people like Becky to uh, give a peer message. And we also, based on our evidence, we identified these key areas. People said that they wanted to give something back, they wanted to learn more skills, and they wanted to be part of something bigger. And giving people the confidence and making them understand that this is something that they can be a part of. Well, from chatting to you and your staff, we're understanding you have a five, five minute call in time. So one of the things that we're, we're saying that you should perhaps consider doing is reviewing this. If you were to do that, you'd actually open yourselves up to a larger target audience that you could market this campaign to. So for example, in Worcester, rather than looking at two or 3,000 people that's around five minutes away, you're actually looking at a wider audience of 16,000. Now it is an actual, you know, it's fantastic in terms of training opportunities. And that's what we really want to drive home, really. And it's all about upskilling firefighters. Um, so if we could focus on that and train the trainers, etc. Things, there's lots of initiatives there that we can build upon. You're the fire service, you have a fantastic reputation, you've got big shiny trucks and everybody wants to be you. Thank you very much for listening. We are Team Catalyst and we'd like to say... Because, because you, you can. can. You talked about the, uh, the five minute um, turn-in or turn-out time and, and ways of change that. Could you just expand on that because I wasn't sure what you were getting at. You have enough trouble recruiting firefighters before you put in the fact that they have to live or work within a five minute response time of the fire station. What we're suggesting, and it's, it, it needs a lot of work and you know, it, it's a, a brave step that will break a mould to a certain extent, is that there isn't necessarily the requirement to live or work and be on call within five minutes of that fire station. I suspect most people who go to a gym probably think in some way they're probably fit enough and they could be. How do we get to those who really think they can't? When we stood in the shopping centre through the survey, there's people out there that don't even know they could be firefighters, the, the normal people if you like. So it's about, you know, the poster campaign can go anywhere, the social, uh, the social media campaign can be targeted, shop windows, car parks, school grounds, instead of one banner on the front of a fire station and an advert in the newspaper, they're big, they're bright, they're shiny, because you can, it's that positive message. And then it's all over bar the judging. For the contestants, relief that that's the last time they'll have to go through that ordeal. Delirious, <laughs> completely delirious and elated and just incredibly grateful to have been on the challenge with these fabulous people and just have such a great experience. <laughs> I've, just, I've stopped, I've switched off. Sorry. <laughs> gone. Yeah, we don't mind. We've had such a good time this one. Doesn't matter who wins. This was my highlight because I got to sit in the fire engine. <laughs> <laughs>
the grasp that you've had of the issues that we face. Time then to hear the verdict. To, hold of them, to manipulate them around, to come up with ideas and then present back uh, has been fantastic and it, and it really has. However, we've decided that on what we've seen today and on what we've read today that the winner is Team Aspire. And that would, of course, usually be that. But not today. Our candidates now face another short wait to find out who's going through to the final and who's going home. And it's clearly still not straightforward. At the moment, some of them are so close that I think we are probably going to end up in a tiebreak situation unless things change dramatically. And I obviously haven't seen the scores from this challenge. So um, it may be possible um, that we'll have to put one or two people through a tiebreak. We'll see. Right. We're nearly down to the final stage of this part of the competition. Um, a few I'm minutes later, the scores have been counted, the, the contestants lined up, and Jude um, Taylor is the first to hear her fate. We definitely want you to come back to the final. <laughs> Angela Glidero also goes through, but Philippa Mellish, Sarah Porter and the absent Kelsey Hill go out at this stage. Now, that leaves four of you. For the rest, there's a surprise. You are all so close that we want you to do a quick tie break. <laughs> one at a time, I'm going to ask you all to go out and then we're going to ask you to come in one at a time and you'll have one minute to sell us your project that you're proposing to put forward uh, for the judges in Harrogate if you get through. What I'm seeing now is a severe skills gap for the construction industry. Jo Iverson goes first. Her work as a chartered project manager with Bolton Council means she's an expert on the ups and downs of the construction industry. There's a lot of people that left the industry, particularly skilled senior professionals or skilled workers. So my proposal is to engage with them and replicate um, models such as the Government Training Association, the GTA, and engage with major contractors and getting them back into something that they deserve to be in. In my area of... Matt Reeks we've next. Alone, we've got to build 8,000 new homes somewhere in the region of the next seven years. What I aim to do is reconstruct the planning policy model so that the local people who are about to move into those houses or who have just moved into those houses, they have a say in what their open space looks like what facilities they have and how they're going to use them. Okay. So then it's Ben Smith. Is something that's called Collective Impact, which is basically bringing a range of partners together, both private and public sector, to address a social issue in an area. So the example that I'll use um, is domestic abuse. So it affects police, it affects the NHS, it affects local councils, and yet we can't work together to address that issue. Collective impact essentially is where you bring them all together and they form an organisation to address that issue collectively. I've seen your project, these guys have And going last, Stuart Lester. Okay, so my project is digital co-production. It's all about getting people together from the community, from the third party ICT that you work with and the in-house IT to actually help build tools that you can share with all the different other authorities, with other services. We're doing a lot of the same things. The community want to get involved and there's, there's tools and methods out there that can make this happen but we as organisations are a little bit close to that so I think we need to change that mindset. And the verdict? I'm going to keep this short, we've decided it is Matt and Ben. Thank you. I think we've got four very worthy finalists for this year's Local Government Challenge. I'm really pleased with the four people we've got. Having said that, we've had nine excellent contestants and it could almost have been any of them. Absolutely staggered at the quality of the people I've just seen. The skills that they have, the ideas they brought to the table and the way they presented them has just been exemplary. I think it's brilliant that you take people out of their normal day-to-day -day roles and put them into something different to build them and to make them into stronger people. I think when I came in I thought how hard can it really be? Um, and I wasn't quite prepared for how tough it was going to be. I'm really interested to find out what everyone's projects are. So much to do, but you know, I really care about my project and I'm really excited and motivated by it. So I'm really kind of relishing this opportunity to, to drive it forward. I shall go to Harrogate and have a good time.